Today, I'm in Derbyshire, the county that's home to most of the Peak District. In the north, you've got the Dark Peaks, and in the south, you've got the White Peaks. Though, to be honest, they're not all kind of peakish. Some of them are a bit more like rolling hills. In that direction, you've got the Lady Bower Reservoir, where they tested the bouncing bomb for the Dam Busters in World War II. And the area is also very famous for its tarts, especially in the Bakewell area. But I'd better be getting on, because as they say around here, if I hang about doing nothing, my brain will be a wool gathering. Derbyshire's a landlocked county that's home to Britain's first ever national park, the Peak District. It's a place of steep hillsides, deep gorges, rolling hills and moors. And running through it, England's mountainous backbone, the Pennines. It's also home to a semi-precious mineral, the Blue John, found at only one location in the world, this cavern in Castleton. This area has been described as a howling wilderness. I'm about to find out how true that is. These are the Gritstone Hills in Derbyshire. They got their name because, well, they're hills and they're made of gritty stone. Yes, they're very imaginative around here. But the stones actually prove rather useful. They've been using it for over 2,000 years to make millstones for grinding grain. And the hills also gave their name to a breed of sheep, the gritstone sheep. Another imaginative use of the word. And they can be traced back to the 1700s, making them one of the oldest hill breeds in Britain. The gritstone is a specific Derbyshire breed, which was in danger of dying out 100 years ago but a group of local farmers created a pedigree stud flock to ensure it survived. It's a particularly good sheep for this area because it's hardy, disease resistant, and survives on very poor grazing land. Its meat is lean and the wool highly prized. Hope and Angus Morris moved 30 years ago from jobs in Manchester to take up farming and breeding pedigree sheep here at High Nightham Farm in Chinley near Glossop. They sell the meat directly from the farm and Hope also sells products made from the wool at local craft fairs and markets. So what made you start farming grit stones in particular? Well, we, we, when we moved here, we, we had the land had been all split up and we wanted to buy it all and bring it all back together again as yeah. original holding. And so I wanted to keep a, a local breed yeah. so the locals didn't think or some sort of clever bloke coming. <laughs> some bloke from the city have come in and ruined and prettified it all. Or, or yeah. kept in some obscure sheep, yeah? Yeah. So they, we kept that local breed. Well, should we go and have a look at them? Yeah. Yes, OK. Lead on. Angus and Hope want to stick with tradition and keep their flock genetically pure. He's even on the committee for the Gritstone Breeders Society. This is serious stuff. Right, so here they are. Let's have a look at them over the wall first. Yeah. So you can see that they're a black and white face, no horns, which is a bit peculiar for a... No horns, any of them? No, they're bred without horns. And there should be no black spots on them. To ensure their sheep stay pure, Angus has to find tups, or rams, which are pedigree through and through. So when you're looking for a tup, where, how, how far afield do you have to go? We go to Plamorant de Clithero, Clithero Sale, which is a breed sale. Right. We'll Clithero is the heart of the gritstone world, is it? I wouldn't say so. No. <laughs> it's Lancashire, isn't it? <laughs> there is a little bit of rivalry between is there? Yeah, the Derbyshire breeders and the yeah. uh, and the. Uh, do you, the do you send do you send yours uh, far afield? No, we'll se we'll s we sell most of our sheep in the autumn sale in Bakewell. Right. That's when we'll sell any sort of breeding ewes that we're going to sell. Do you eat them? Eat them, yes, of course yes. we do, well, yes. Well, some people don't. Some people sort of keep them as pets and... Oh, no, no. Keep them, you know. Oh, no, they're kept on a commercial basis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're tasty? Very tasty meat, very yeah. tasty meat. That's, the, that's why we keep them. That's why we've continued to keep them. You know, they're fed on grass all the time. Yeah. And they uh, produce a very lean, sweet meat. The bigger sheep in this field are over a year old, so they're no longer lambs. They're now hoggets. If they were another year older, they'd be mutton. Today, Angus and Hope need to check them over 
because very soon these hoggets will be ready for market. And I'm here to help round them up. Well, try not to get in the way. Oh, come on. Let's get them into a pen. The sheep, that is, not Angus and Hope. So without a dog, how do you round them up? Well, it's probably difficult the first time when they have lambs with them because they're not quite sure what they're yeah. doing. Yeah. Right, let's give it a go. <laughs> you got the practised walk there. Hope of someone who's done this a lot. Are you the one who's sent out like the sheepdog? I am, I am, I am. <laughs> Come on. Oh, they've all gone that way now. Come on. Make a brilliant dog. Come on, lady. I think you're super winning at the minute. Well, this could take a while. Maybe it's time to see a man about a dog. Angus might not own one, but he knows a man who does. His neighbour, Steve. So you uh, you help Angus out when he when he needs a bit of uh, proper sheepdog well, work doing, yeah. Now and again. And who's this dog? This is Moss. It's very devoted. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit shy to be honest. Yeah. How old? Three. Just turned yeah. three. Yeah. Well, should we uh, see see what it can do? Go on. Oh, Angus, you need to get yourself a dog. You're in. Well, let's have a look at these. After separating the hoggets from their lambs, Angus asked neighbour Steve for some advice. Steve's a farmer who's been breeding grit stones his whole life and is an expert when it comes to pedigree. So. Which animals should stay and which should go to market? If this hog was going for the meat trade, that would be about spot on. I worked Presumably. a bit in a local market. Yeah. yeah. Grading and So you're just you. feeding them out of meat, really? Yeah, around. coverage over the ribs. Yeah. Going down to the top of the dock. It's not too fat. Yeah. Just got the right amount of cover, really. This has got a nice tight fleece. Yes, it is. It's a good fleece for Gritston. Yeah. I'd say that's about spot on. Yeah. So you'd keep this as a as a <laughs> yeah, as a well, use. Actually, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and sending it off. Yeah. yeah. Well, we did send a couple in last Monday. They had a black mark on the fleece, you know, so we, yeah. we thought we'd better go in for meat than breeding, yeah. Did you not think you could just cut the white the black bits off? And... Certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> Is there no subterfuge in the Gristling world? <laughs> Certainly not. No, no. Good, honest farmers. <laughs> so, which of these had passed the, uh, the Gristling Association? <coughs> well, is there any that, that had failed, or are they all going to pass? Well, to guess, I'd say this small one in the back. Yeah. If a registrar was coming to find half a dozen of, look at half a dozen of these, well, he, yeah. he might register it, but when it's amongst some good big hogs like this, yeah. they just pull this one out straight away because it's small. Yeah. It's fairly dark. They go through it with a fine tooth comb. Yeah. What's the, what's the, what's the rules about the legs? And... You see, up to the wool mark, they can be whatever they want within reason. Yeah. But as soon as the black starts coming up into the fleece, they don't like that. That's not too that's bad. Really coming up. That, not right too there, bad that. Yeah. That that'd pass. Yeah. That'd pass. Well, thanks very much for showing me around. Angus is. Th thank you. Okay. I'm really keen to taste some. All oh, right. Well, so we how, sent, how can I do that? Can well, we sent a couple off last Monday to yeah. butchers. Yeah. Local butcher. Yes. Yeah. Metrics in. Uh, in Glossop. All right. Yeah. So if I go down to him, I can I can ask him for your particular lamb. You can do, yes. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go and do that. Yeah. Right, I'm just going to take a photo right now. We obviously a bit difficult to get the sheep up here. So so this is made from the wool of your sheep. Yes. yes. And it looks rather gorgeous. So <clears throat> here we go. I can see a bit of sheepage in the background. I think that's going to be a cracker. Well, that was a charming little setup, I thought. I think it's important that people keep odd breeds of sheep going because, you know, 
the commercial world is driven to these kind of meat factory kind of things and they you know we don't know what we're doing with the gene pool there so it's best to keep it as diverse as possible and one way of doing that is keeping old breeds going John. Yes, I am. How are you Pleased to meet you. I've just been up at Angus and Hope's farm. All oh, right. I right. believe they sell some of their sheep through you. Yeah, I mean, the, these are the Derbyshire Gritstone um, yeah. Hoggets. Uh, Hoggets have been a year that. old lamb. Yeah, between yeah. one and two years, yeah. And these, yeah. these are more lambs as sort well. Sort of halfway between lamb and mutton, really. Yeah, that's it? it. If it's over two years, then it's mutton. If it's under yeah. a year, it's lamb. I always find it a bit tastier, a hogget, than, than lamb. lamb. Lamb's often a bit flavourless, isn't it? Yeah, There's... well, spring lamb particularly, it's more about tenderness than yeah. taste, but the hogget, because it's been on that natural environment, that natural grazing for a long time, really does carry a lot of flavour. So you think, I mean, this is something people don't really understand, that, that lamb can get a different flavour just by, by what it eats. Yeah, well, it, well, it is know. what it eats. That, yeah. That's exactly, that's exactly yeah. what it is. John believes that the meat from High Nightham Farm is especially good because the Gritstone's a pedigree, something which has earned Hope and Angus official recognition. Hope has this environmental quality mark, which means that the Peak District actually monitor it to make sure that she looks after the whole environmental picture. So she's looking after the flora, the fauna, the architecture, the archaeology, the whole lot. Yeah. And this is the result of, of that um, husbandry, yeah. is, is these fantastic tasting lambs. So you're going to show me the difference between yeah, you, lamb and I mean, I mean if, if you look at the colours there, can you see how that one's at a lighter colour? Yeah. Almost, you know, it's almost been orange when spring lamb first comes in, and that's because it's been fed on a diet of corn and, and the mother's milk. Yeah, yeah, it's both. It hasn't had any grass yet. Yeah. And as the season goes on, uh, this meat will become darker and darker and darker. And obviously when you've got something like a hoggy here that's been grazing on natural yeah. vegetation for up to two years, it becomes quite a dark colour. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, let's go and cook some up. Right, OK, well, I'm just going to cut this out here. I've just got to fold a little seam down here by the ribs to take this middle neck out so you don't rob the shoulder. Yeah. So you're trying to leave enough meat on the middle neck and enough meat on the shoulder as well. Okay. So there we are, there's your neck. Marvellous. Right, you're going to come out and have a bit? Well, I'd love to. I think about it. taste it, make sure it's all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be dreadful it went wrong now, wouldn't Oof. it? <laughs> here we are, nearly done, I think. Shall we try a bit of that? Delicious, that, yeah. A hot pan and a little bit of butter, and Angus and Hope's gritstone is put to our taste test. Except for that, I went through it like butter. Nothing on it, no salt, no pepper. Amazing. Very tasty, Lots and lots of flavour. Mm. And what makes this so tasty is the age of the meat. It's not lamb, don't forget, it's hogget. And you know, yep. Hope's That's done. a bit of neck and it's not no. It's not over chewy, is it? No, not at all. No, it's very, very soft. I've only just fried it off. Mm. Very good. I can't speak because I'm, I'm uh, enjoying it that much. Mm. Yeah. Terrific. Should we have some more? I think we well, yeah, I'll <laughs> stand another piece. The flavour this meat gets from having a bit longer on the hills makes all the difference. Mustn't forget my middle neck. I'll be cooking that up later. Hey. Oh, yeah. mm. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Cheers. Well, thanks to you, John. All right. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure to find out about bits of meat that most of us don't know anything about. You know, no. we all think we know what we're eating, but, but we don't. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy the rest of that. I'm sure you will. Of course, enough there to make quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, feed an army there. <laughs> What I really like about John and traditional butchers in general is these are people that know the difference in flavours between different meats and different varieties of sheep. You know, that's a special talent. I'm travelling around Britain with my trusted little caravan behind me, discovering the food and traditions that make this country great. Today, I'm in Derbyshire. Extraordinary. Take miles. It's like being in a low-flying aircraft sometimes. I've already got to grips with a grit stone. Come on, ladies. I think the sheep are winning at the minute. And now I'm off to learn about a tradition that's quite literally dividing these hills. The thing about Derbyshire is that it's mostly hills, and hills 
and then some more hills. And on those hills, they've got a lot of cows and sheep. And to stop them wandering off, they've got a lot of walls, dry stone walls. And they're really rather beautiful. So I'm off to see a champion dry stone waller. Yes, they have competitions to find out more about this ancient craft and why it's having a bit of a renaissance. Dry stone walls have existed in Derbyshire for four and a half thousand years. That's some staying power. They were initially built with the stones dug out of the ground during ploughing and designed to keep animals and crops apart. As time went on, the walls became more widespread in the peaks, especially as the supply of stone grew with the development of local quarries. Trevor Rag rebuilds old crumbling walls using traditional methods. He passes on his knowledge and experience to wannabe wallers in open-air classrooms. Trevor. Yes. I'm Adrian. How do you do, Adrian? You? You're a champion dry stone waller. Yes. What makes a good Derbyshire dry stone wall? Well, Derbyshire walls, well, you have got the two types. You've got the grit stone like this. Right. Or if you go into the what we call the white peak, the white peak that yeah. is the limestone, the white stone. Right. Uh, and that's a little bit different technique of building. Is it? It's more Just random. Because... Yes. So, uh, so this is grit stone. Yes. And these are kind of what them, I mean, it looks kind of quite a regular type of wall, yeah. isn't it? I mean, they yeah. look like bricks, not, not like no, bricks, but they, not bricks. But, but, but they, there's some of them that, yeah, they're that more are regular, pretty square. Yeah, more regular shapes. Yeah. This is what you call, you can have enough course, it's similar to what you call brick lane. Yeah. But if you've got the limestone, it's more funny shapes, triangles and yeah. all, and it's more interlocking. My, pre my preference is the limestone, really. Oh, is it? I would say it's a stronger wall. That's yeah. my preference, but... Can we test this one? You can test it if you want. Oh, I to say. That, that is, oh, that one moved a bit, but... Never come pretty, off it. Pretty, pretty solid. <laughs> Trevor's technique stems from ancient methods that have stood the test of time. It's built like a capital A. It's like that shape. Yeah. It's like oh, twice yeah. as wide yeah. in the base. And is there much of a foundation? Yes. And you've got big stones like this underneath that size. All right, so that's the foundation. Yes, or there might be even one lower down. Yeah. One below that. Yeah. And you try and put the largest yeah. in the bottom. It's no good putting those at the top yeah. because they wouldn't fit. And also yeah. it would be top Maybe heavy. To lift. Correct. <laughs> you make the stone do the work, not you. Yeah. And as you come up, you try and grade your stone. That's the, your Stop middle, fill all your heart in. Yeah. That is also as important as your two outside stones like these. Keep this, this solid, and if you can see daylight through a wall, that shows it's been yeah. badly built. This is basically doing the same job as concrete, isn't it? What? No, well, I know that's the, uh, uh, the wrong word to use to a dry stone it wall. Is. But it is. But it's what it's doing is making a kind of solid, solid mass. Yes, it is. That's, that's yes. not moving. I'll let you off and on it's, that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of cheap. Not, uh, not a cheap. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an artistic, <laughs> crafty. Yes, yes. I know. It's, it's a most splendid, uh, different way of doing it. <laughs> yeah, like I said, you don't throw these in. You place them in. Right. And yeah. it's holding both sides of the wall together. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And then we finish off with what we call the cope stones, which tie both sides of your wall together as well. Yeah. And it's the finishing touch to your wall and sealing it all. Marvellous. Well, can I, can, can I have a go? If you want to have a go, sir. Yeah. All right, there, uh, about halfway across that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Now you've finished those, if you get some more middle fill, yeah. there, mate, just to put in there. This is grit stone. Yes. Which is kind of used in millstones, isn't it? Yes. Millstones just a little bit more coarser than this. That's quite soft, that, isn't it? It is. It's very crumbly as well. Oh, yeah. It's nearly like sandstone. It's like a biscuit. Yeah. I don't, I'm not just chucking these in. I'm no, making them. If you place them in, then it's keeping supporting yeah. your two outside stones, your building yeah. stones. That's is that right? it. My God, you'll make a wall yet. Yeah. They've said that's me before. Have they? <laughs> How does it take to do a stretch? Um, taking this wall down yeah. and putting it back, yeah. three metres, I could do that in a day. All right. And there's a, roughly a guideline of about a tonne of stone to every linear metre. Right. So if I took four down, that's four tonne taken down, put on the floor, 
and then four ton put back again in the day. So that's eight ton of stones through yeah. my hands in that's the day. Quite a lot, isn't it? So you have got to be fit. Yeah, you have. When you've been taking dilapidated walls apart and rebuilding them, have you ever found anything interesting? We have found coins. Oh, yeah. There, there's right, yeah. gold sovereigns have been found. Yeah. Or even unusual, somebody's found a very old pistol gun in really? the wall, which was involved in a murder Ooh. over 100 years ago. Yeah. So they are a good hiding place. Yeah. Did you yeah. find a gun? Uh, I haven't. I found bullets and things oh, yeah. like that, yeah. So uh, we've got our wall there. Yes. And uh, what, what makes a great, great cope stone? Well, if you just turn around... You've saved these out we've already. Saved the, oh, these, these were on the top of the wall before. Some of them was, but yeah. we were always short. Yeah. We were always short of what we call the copers. The same as the, the things people nick the first when they're kind of just building something, yes. isn't they? Well, when you think there's about a fiver's worth there... Is it? Yes, if you go to a garden centre, no. just a one stone like that. But that's what we're looking for, yeah. is, is a shape like, like a D, yeah. like that. Yeah. And that's its bottom, it sits up. And you want a little belly in that, generally. That's it, yeah. And it sits up and that's tying, finishing your wall, tying yeah. both sides of your wall together. Should we try and stick that one on? Would you like to put it yes. on, sir? Yes, that would be a nice finishing Are you moment. all right? Right, hold it close to your, to your body like that, yeah. health and safety. Yeah. And then you've got more control over it. All right. Don't hold it out like that. Okay. Well, I bet health and yeah. safety wasn't an issue when this wall was first built. Well, so, coping your cope. Same. It's a, one cope, yeah, that's it. Just be oh, gentle. That's, that's not bad, is it? That's it. That's that well. So that's... See, so that's tied both sides. Yeah. It's touching that one, touching that, and yeah, it's stable. Pretty solid. Yeah. Well, I think I might leave the rest of these people because they look very keen. Aren't you? I've got so much to do, I've got to go and see Ooh, a big old tart. Yeah. Oh, have you now? <laughs> yes. I don't know her name yet, but yeah. I'm going to go and see her. I bet you'll soon find out. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to meet you, Trevor. Thank you very much, Thank Dave. you very much indeed. <laughs> well, what a splendid geezer Trevor was. I really liked him. Not only because he showed us how walls work, but also because he gave me this. Could come in handy before the end of the programme. I'm journeying around Britain, tracking down traditions and customs. And here in Derbyshire, I've hauled stones in the fields and herded sheep in the hills. Tell you what, it's all a bit up and down around here. I don't think we've had a flat road for miles. I wonder if that's why it's called Peak District. And now I'm on my way to the heart of Derbyshire to get to the bottom of a very sticky issue. I'm here in the town of Bakewell, famous for, well, there's the problem, because you'd expect me to say Bakewell tart, but it's argued by some people around here that no such thing ever existed, and that it's the pudding that it's famous for. It's an argument that's been going on for 150 years, and I'm going to visit the pudding shop and the tart shop and get to the bottom of this once and for all. The story told locally is that in the 1860s, a hapless cook at this hotel was trying to bake a strawberry tart. But it must have been a bad day because she got the ingredients mixed up. And the thing that came out of the oven became a new culinary sensation. The Bakewell pudding. Or was it a tart? Well, that forms the crux of the argument. Because at one end of the town, Zoe McBurney makes tarts with short crust pastry and believes she's got the true Bakewell creation. And at the other end of town, Gemma Feezy thinks her puddings made with puff pastry are the real deal. Surely this town can't be big enough for both of them. Or can it? Hi there. Are you Gemma? I am, yes. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And you? Uh, I'm trying to get to the bottom of the tart pudding controversy. Right, OK. What would you Which like Which came to know? first, the tart or the pudding? Definitely the pudding in Bakewell. The tart doesn't come from here. So what, what, what's your evidence? The evidence is in the history, obviously, of the Bakewell yeah. pudding that originates from Bakewell in the 1840s. Yeah, so what's, what's, what's your version of the story? Well, the Bakewell pudding was first made by, made by mistake from the White Horse Inn that is now the Rutland Arms Hotel. Which is just out there. That's exactly right. Yeah. And the so cook... So what, what, what was the mistake? Well, the cook was making it for noblemen who were passing through Bakewell. Yeah. And she made a mistake, she didn't put the mixture right together, and born was a bakewell pudding, she had nothing else, so she had to serve it. Right. And they loved it, 
So right. she carried on making it. So uh, are you going to show me how to make a pudding? Yeah, absolutely. Shall we go? Yeah, Lovely. marvellous. <clears throat> well, that sounds jolly convincing. So I put, what am I doing with these? Pushing okay. the bubbles out? Yeah, exactly. When you, you, when you move this it between puff your... It's puff pastry. So when you move it between your fingers, yeah. you can feel the bubbles popping underneath. You need to be a bit firmer with it, so... Yes, madam. <laughs> <laughs> You're very firm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and you make sure all the lips are starting to come up at yeah. the sides. But okay. every pudding's made by hand still, so they all look a they little bit They all look different. different. And yeah, that's exactly. part, of, part of the appeal, really. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, though it looks like a homemade pudding, because it, it is a homemade it pudding. It is, exactly, yeah. yeah. Still all made by Not hand. Not made by machines. No, exactly. So, yeah. is that right? That's excellent, yeah. So you have your foil, place it into your foil, and then you need to push it down into the foil so when it goes into the oven yeah. it's not going to expand massively and actually blow up as well because you, you don't want bubbles on there you don't want bubbles in, in the pastry because that will push the An mixture exploding out. pastry <laughs> my heart's beating very fast <laughs> now this is the mixture this is the mixture but we're going to go to the jam first all right okay so the jam in the original recipe book it just says red jam but traditionally since the 1860s since the pudding was first made here yeah. it's been strawberry jam so that's what we stick to right you don't want to go massively as well with the uh, strawberry jam because the put because the oven is so hot um, that that again will start to bubble okay. and push all the mixture out. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in here is the eggs, almonds, sugar, and butter. Now this has been left to eggs, rest. Eggs, almonds, sugar, and butter. That's is that correct. it? That's it with the secret ingredient, obviously. With the secret ingredient. Yeah. And is the secret ingredient some kind of essence, or is it a? I can't tell you. <sighs> And they can't give me any kind of clue. Is it a food item? It's obviously a food <laughs> item, yes. Yes, you might be able to taste it. Is it some it. kind of uh, liquor? Some I can't tell you. Brandy? I can't tell you. No, there's no telling what it is. No, definitely not. And but you, know, you have the recipe up in the shop, don't you? We do we, have the recipe up in the shop. without the secret ingredient. Exactly, just missing that one ingredient. So yeah. you can make a bacon pudding to our but recipe. But it's not as good as just yours. To, exactly, exactly. So place that over your jam. You don't want a lot again, because at 400 degrees it will it's just blow out. out. Yeah. You don't need to spread it around because it's so hot again, it will solidify and go into a enough? lovely pudding. That's perfect. Yeah, over the top. It's very easy to make, isn't it? Isn't if you it don't just... have to spread anything out. Yeah. And then that goes onto the baking tray. That's, that seems too simple. Doesn't it just? And we will bake those. Eggs, sugar and almonds, yeah. secret ingredient. Exactly. I mean, that's, I could make yeah, that. Exactly, you can make it at home. <laughs> it's perfect. Gemma's oven is set at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 200 degrees Celsius to you and me. Yep. Oh, I see, yeah. Done. Marvellous. I'll pull that in. Shall I pull that back out? Yeah. 20 Marvelous. minutes and we'll okay. be done. Now, while it's cooking, I'm just going to give you a bit of a judicial review on this claim. OK. So when do you claim your pudding was first made? 1840s. Any particular date? No. Ah, that's a bit, bit of a, a blow, because this is Eliza Acton's book. OK. Which was first published in 1845. OK. She has... Bakewell pudding. Ah, she does. Which is great. But it does say this pudding is famous not only in Derbyshire. And I think that's But in correct. several other northern counties. With the town of Bakewell, we stick to the, the recipe that was born here. Yeah. And with the puff pastry and, and the strawberry you, jam. What do you think of the tart, be honest? Do I like the taste of the yeah. tart? Um, yes, I like the taste of the tart. What do I think of the history of it being from England? I don't like that, because it yeah. takes it away from the town of Bakewell. Yeah. You know? Where do you think the tart was made? Well, I think it, it's originally from America, according to Is the it? history books. Yes, right. yes. Okay. It dates back further than the Bakewell pudding, as far as All I right. know. All right. But to somewhere in America? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we're not interested in American things, are we? No. This is aid in Britain. <laughs> Indeed it is. Okay. And aid has got a pudding to get out of the oven. Ready? If you give them a quick shake when you get them out of the oven, you can tell whether they're set or not. All right. And they don't wobble. There we go. There's our puddings. Quite hot. Yes, very hot. Normally you'd eat it with your fingers, wouldn't you? Well, warm, with custard yeah. or cream's great. Yeah. That jam will be really so hot, my jam. careful. Yeah. This is where I lose my lips and my <laughs> roof of my mouth. <laughs> Looks lovely, doesn't it? It does. Look at that. Isn't that nice? Mm. Is that mine? Yeah, I think that one is yours, yeah, actually. Yeah, very good. Mmm. <laughs> That's delicious. Good, I'm glad you enjoy it. Well, thank you very much. That's fine. I'm going to go and visit the tart shop and uh, give them a thorough going over. Yes, do. Thank you very much. No worries, my pleasure. Meeting. Yeah, and you, thank you. Well, that's the pudding story done and dusted. I'd better investigate the tart's point of view. 
I mean Zoe. She's here at Bakewell's Tart Shop. Where else? Where traditional tarts have been made for more than 50 years. Hi, you must be Zoe. I am. Zoe I made. How do you do? Pleased to, nice meet, to you. meet you. Now, I'm here sort of discussing the two shops, the controversy between the tart and the pudding mm. in Bakewell. Yeah. Give me your theory. My theory? Yeah. Right, well, my theory is that the traditional tart, which is the one that we're famous for here, yeah. is made with short crust pastry. Yeah. Uh, the Bakewell pudding is made with a puff pastry, mm -hmm. which, if you look back on the history of puff pastry, didn't actually come into this country until um, by the French in the early 1900s. So right. there's a bit of uh, debate there as to whether it should be puff pastry or short crust pastry. But pastry is not the only issue here. To muddle the mix even more, another little tart has got in on the act, making things exceedingly confusing. You're up against a very big commercial baker of well, we baker yes. tarts, aren't you? Whose yes. his, his recipe is quite different to yours. It is very different. Yeah. Yeah. Our traditional tart does not have icing and it doesn't have a cherry. But that is the so traditional tart. This is the original. Tart. Can we That's taste a bit of it? You certainly can, yes. So there's your traditional tart there. Yeah. Now, can which I tell you what they different. say about your tart? What? Which is, by the way, delicious and a lot less cakey. Mm. Then, um, oh, it's more like a custard, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm. They say it was invented in America. America? Yeah. Well, I've not heard that one before. Haven't you? That recipe is from somebody that's lived in Derbyshire for over 70 years. Yeah. And that's been passed back down by right. generations. And what's the secret ingredient? I can't tell you. Because? Because I don't eat. My husband bakes these at the bakery yeah. with. Mr. Jackson, who owns the bakery as well. Um, and they won't tell me that secret recipe. Won't they? No. And I'd rather they didn't tell me, because if they did, I might... You have to shoot I, I yourself. Might, yes. <laughs> so I don't know. All I know is that every day I order hundreds and they send them over to me. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. It's been fascinating. <laughs> it's been great to meet you. All right, yeah. Thanks very much. Well, I'm still no closer to solving the pudding tart controversy. A bit higher, if possible? That's good. <laughs> Good smile. Is Zoe's tart actually from America? Looking proud. <laughs> Cracker. When did the puff pastry for Gemma's pudding arrive in Britain? Maybe there is room for both. So, I've tried Bakewell tart and I've tried Bakewell pudding. Which is best? Well, there's only one way to sort this out. Fight! Amazing to think that all this is just a few miles outside Manchester. I'm in Derbyshire on my travels around Great Britain, hunting for traditional food and time-honoured customs. I've seen some sights. Oh, that is beautiful. I could drive around Britain all year. I've done dry stone walling, my God, you'll make a wally yet. I've had a twist with a tart, and a tart with a twist. Oh, so much sugar, I feel. <laughs> nice. And now I'm in the village of Eam, about to roll up my sleeves and cook up a Derbyshire dish from the back of my caravan for some, well, hairy royals. Well, there are lots of quirky customs in Britain, and Morris dancing is certainly one of them. Now, the origins of Morris dancing are not particularly clear, but what is clear is that each region has its own distinct style, and Derbyshire is no different. Hit it, guys. Opposite. Morris dancing is said to originate from the Crusades. They've been dancing in Derbyshire since 1797. In times gone by, they entertained at local festivals and fairs. These are the Winston Morris dancers, carrying on that tradition.
splendid. Thanks, chaps. Uh, I'm just going to come and have a chat down here. Now, you seem to be the head man of all this. <laughs> Fine. Is this all your fault? <laughs> uh, I suppose so, really, yes. Who are these two here? Uh, king and Queen. We've always had a King and Queen since, mm. uh, since this Winston Marriage Nancy began. Yeah, and you had a kind of witch-like chat. A witch, yes. Witch we normally have a jester, but we have, unfortunately we haven't got one tonight. Oh, you're right. Well, I'll be your jester. Good. <laughs> All right. And what's the history? What's the reason for Morris dancing? I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> Is it just it's having fun? for centuries, you know, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of vaguely pagan, isn't it's it? It's a real tradition it's in It's kind in, of cocking a snig to authority, yes. I think, isn't it? Do you think? I think so, yes. Yeah. Well, I wish you all. I'm going to make you all a nice lobby. Uh, as thanks for that. So um, I'll just cook it up and then uh, I'll feed you in a minute. Thank you. What I'm making today is um, a Derbyshire lobby, um, which is a very simple dish. Uh, some people think it's called a lobby because they just lobbed whatever they had into a pot. It's a very poor person's dish. It's got very few ingredients and it's a way of getting the most flavour out of the fewest ingredients. These are uh, actually middle neck chops from um, Angus's Hoggets. So um, if they don't taste good, we'll blame him. As the meat is browned off, it releases the fat, so there's no need to use any butter or oil. The great thing about these kind of cuts of meat is they have there's quite a lot of bone in them. And while obviously <laughs> you're not going to eat the bone, it can add a lot of flavour. So just leave that fat to render down a bit while I cut the carrots. <clears throat> the Edmondson way, which is time saving, three at a time. Nice big lumps. Look, still got all my fingers. Brown the meat all over before removing it from the heat and adding the vegetables. The thing about a lobby is um, there are several derivations of where it came from. It's either kind of, there's a kind of Norwegian idea, Norwegian-German fisherman coming to Liverpool with something called labskous, which is a kind of meat stew made from corned beef and whatever they had hanging around. Then you've got scouse, of course, which is the lobscouse from Liverpool, uh, which is a similar kind of stew. They have a kind of lobby in Staffordshire where they use beef, and they have a call in Wales where they use ham or pork. And uh, here in Derbyshire they're using lamb. I think, you know, it's just about people using the cheapest cuts or whatever they've got available and getting really most, a lot of flavour to stick on their potatoes. One of the other theories about the name lobby, uh, very, quite a childish one, is um, the idea that when it's kind of cooking overnight, because you leave it for a long time to cook, it's you could leave it on a slow heat and it's just going lump. Lump. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> they don't believe me. Once the veggies have sweated for five or so minutes, put the meat back in and add the potatoes. In this dish, I've probably got the proportion of meat to potatoes is a kind of modern proportion. I think back in olden times, they'd have had about half amount of meat and twice as many potatoes. Then I'm going to stick on water. It's no stock, it's just water. It's a simple, plain dish. And people say what differentiates a lobby from other foods is it's, is it's neither a stew nor a soup. It's somewhere in between. And I'm just adding a little bit of time because I've got a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> I mean, that's very simple, isn't it? And it looks kind of, well, vaguely appetising in the moment, but not really nice. The thing is, if you leave that on a slow heat overnight, by the following evening, it'll be delicious. Trust me. Don't worry if you're not catching all of this. There'll be recipe details a bit later on. Well, here we are. This is the lobby I've been making. And uh, as you can see, it's... Uh, it's still got a long way to go because the lobby takes about 24 hours really. So I've cheated and uh, I've got one here that I started yesterday. And as you can see, it's, it's a better looking dish altogether. So I'm going to serve a bit of this to His Majesty and Her Majesty. <clears throat> and I'll get their opinion. I suppose the Queen comes first. 
and more or less everything. There you go, Your Highness. There you go. Take your own irons. <clears throat> I'm afraid you have to come last because you're just a commoner, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Your Majesty. Thank you very much. Well, what's the verdict? It's absolutely it's delicious. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely it's kind of halfway between a stew and a soup, isn't it? It is, yeah. Which is, um, it's very tasty. Yeah. And the water's been made tasty just by cooking it for a very long time. Mm. It's a beautiful flavour. Yeah. Put a little bit of thyme in there, but there's nothing much else to add flavour. You know? There's no kind of special ingredients. Really? Mm. Yeah. If you want to try this at home, here's how I did it. For this Derbyshire lobby, I'm using middle neck of lamb from local gritstone sheep, but any cheap cut will do. Don't bother trimming any excess fat. This adds flavour and means you don't have to use butter or oil. Once the meat is browned, remove and add the onions and carrots, then let them sweat. Put everything back in together with some salt and pepper for seasoning. Add water, in keeping with tradition, or stock if you prefer, and cook on a low heat overnight. Or you could use a slow cooker. If you want more details of what you've seen in today's show, you can find it at itv.com slash food. There you go, a simple but delicious traditional dish, Derbyshire Lobby. There's still one thing I need to clear up before leaving Derbyshire, a pressing question of taste. Now, as you're a local boys, I want to ask you a burning question, uh, which is going to resolve an issue that's deep in the heart of Derbyshire. Bakewell tart or Bakewell pudding? Pudding. Bakewell pudding. pudding. You? <laughs> yes. Bakewell pudding. Bakewell pudding. But we're still no Nero knowing which came first. So let's just have a dance. Well, that's it from Derbyshire. Home of the hills, home of sheep and a rather winning pudding. But don't forget, it's also famous for its tarts. 